unstoppable. I see it now. The beasts that will devour the world. We have a massive wealth of new Stellaris information today. There is a massive rework to the Psionic Ascension and the way that covenants work after we get ascended. You will be bargaining your soul in no time and shouting death to the false emperor in order to get your hands on these fantastic bonuses and upgrades. There is also some exciting news on a big accessibility change. Text to speech is now in the open beta and you can try it out for yourselves right now. And we've had some major changes made to the open beta in only the first week. So we've got a full patch notes to go through there. I will of course put chapters in so you can jump around and look at the specific pieces that you'd like. Prepare your soul for the sacrifice to come and without any further ado, let's dive in. Mr. Cosmogon bids you salutations. He is the high speaker of the Instrument of Desire. For those of you familiar with the Warhammer 40,000 universe, that is basically Slanesh. And Mr. Cosmogon is here to share tantalizing tidbits about the upcoming Covenants rework. Now, first of all, a little bit of context for those of you that might be unfamiliar with Covenants. Currently in the game, after completing your Psionic Ascension, you are granted access to the Shroud, a mystical dimension where all Psionics draw power from. To take the Warhammer 40,000 comparison, that is the Warp. When you explore the Shroud, you encounter random events, one of which would let you make a bargain with an Eldritch entity. This would give you an Empire modifier, and every 25 years or so, there would be a price to pay. The new Ascension rework, currently testable in the open beta, made it so that at the end of the Tradition Tree, you would get a shot at forming a Covenant without having to explore the Shroud so much. This was liked very much by Mr. Cosmogon, however, he felt that they could go a little bit further with this. And today we're going to be getting a look at brand new reworks for all of the Covenants, as well as a whole bunch of extra modifiers and changes that are going to come with that. Strap yourselves down ladies and gentlemen, because where we're going, we won't need eyes to see. In the rework, upon first attempting to breach the Shroud, you will get a chance to form a covenant with one of the current entities. Chosen semi-randomly, the chances vary depending on your ethics, civics, traditions, ascension perks, and more. You can refuse them and venture into the Shroud on your own, but accepting will give you a weaker version of the current covenant modifiers. Now just to preface this a little bit before we go any further, what is in essence happening here is you are delving into the Shroud or the Warp and you are forming a pact with one of the four Chaos Gods. They have unique names in Stellaris, however they are in essence Nurgle, Slanesh, Korn and Zeech. And from a rough perspective in terms of the modifiers and what they do, they do generally tend to follow along with what each of those Chaos Gods would represent in the game. Here we can see an example of what would happen if you first delved into the Shroud and you were offered to start a covenant with the Eater of Worlds, otherwise known as Korn. You would get plus 7% ship fire rate and plus 25% army damage, in theory in perpetuity, but now we get to the next part which is rather interesting. You see a little while later you'll then be prompted to confirm the covenant. Refusing removes your patron and their modifier, but accepting will give you a situation log entry about the Covenant. So now Covenants are going to be represented by situations in the game. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's how it's going to start working. And you will slowly start increasing in Covenant rank as your Empire attunes telepathically to its patron. Every patron will provide different bonuses, but they will all follow the same structure. Upon forming the Covenant, you will get a weak Empire modifier. Upon confirmation, Telepath jobs will now provide pop growth, naval capacity, amenities or research depending on which god you have pledged your fealty to. After around 5 years, Telepath jobs bonuses will become stronger and you will gain access to an Empire unique building providing more Telepath jobs and unique bonuses. The example that we can see here is that if you form a covenant with Korn or the Eater of Worlds, after a time your telepaths will now provide additional naval capacity and you can build the Sanctum of the Eater on a single planet. You hunger, 
and only war can sate you. And if you're enjoying this video, please defile that like button in the name of the dark gods. And what does that building do? What is the Sanctum of the Eater? Well, it is an empire unique building that will grant you an empire modifier of plus 10% ship's weapons range and minus 10% ship upkeep. That is a phenomenally powerful bonus. The weapons range is good, but that reduction in ship upkeep is astoundingly good. You'll also get three fantastic telepath jobs, which not only provide unity, they also provide increased resource output from jobs and a general reduction to crime. In this case, it's estimated that the three telepaths that are added to this planet will provide 50 unity, minus 30 crime, a whopping plus 30% resource output from jobs, and plus 36 naval capacity. At the cost of only eight energy and two exotic gases per month, this is a really, really good building. After around 15 years, roughly, there is a big ish on this, and we'll get to why it's an ish in a little bit, but the weak empire modifier is then replaced with a stronger one. For example, if you've pledged to corn, your ship fire rate will double from 7.5% to 15%, and army damage will do the same, going up to plus 50%. The text does want you to bear in mind, though, there is always a price to pay. After roughly 30 years, one of your leaders can be selected to become chosen, becoming immortal, and gaining a unique leader trait, with effects varying depending on your patron and the leader's class. This does not block you from getting the chosen one trait when venturing into the shroud, and they can even be stacked together if luck or the chaos gods are truly on your side. Here is an example of what one of the leader traits will be. Here in the kingdom of Yapathi, the leader Arsini gains the chosen of the eater trait, or chosen of corn. This will grant the following effects. Minus 10% ship upkeep and plus 15% ship build speed, along with granting them everlasting life. This is clearly the trait for a ruler that becomes chosen, and it seems like the rulers are the better options for becoming chosen most of the time. We have a full list of what all of those abilities are though, so do stick around for that. After roughly 50 years, you reach the very last and final stage of the Covenant. You gain access to a unique patron-specific ship component. The example we get to look at here is for the corn entity, and that is the Mark of the Eater. This is an auxiliary component that requires quite a bit of throw, and it gives you plus 20% orbital bombardment damage and plus 5 chance to hit, making it a slightly better version of the auxiliary fire control. And before you get worried that it's only corn that gets a fantastic new ship component, don't be alarmed, ladies and gentlemen, and any demon entities that might currently be listening. You see, each of the dark powers gets their own unique ship component. Slanesh gets the mark of the instrument, plus 25% sublight speed and minus 5% ship upkeep. That ship upkeep, when combined with other reductions in ship upkeep modifier, is really, really good, in my humble opinion. Zeech provides the Mark of the Whisperers, giving you plus 15% evasion. For those of you upset about the loss of max evasion destroyers, this may go a long way to offsetting that current inability. This, along with other modifiers, might hopefully get us close to around 70 or 80% like it was back in the glory days. Especially because if you put multiple of these on the same ship, they should in fact stack. And last, but by absolutely no means least, is Grandfather Nurgle, who gives us the mark of the composer, a whopping plus 10% daily hull regen and plus 15% daily armor regen. Now, don't forget that these bonuses, these modifiers, are reduced by a factor of 10, I believe it's 10, when you're in combat. So during combat, this is in actuality only plus 1% daily hull regen and plus 1.5% daily armor regen. But outside of combat, this is a massive and phenomenal amount of hull and armor regeneration. Truly fitting of the Lord of Pestilence. We also get to have a deep look here at what all of the different bonuses will be at each of the different levels. So, from left to right in this table, what we have here is Nurgle, Corn. Slanesh, and finally Zeech on the end. If you're looking for the Warhammer 40,000 or just Warhammer Fantasy analogy. 
To make things easier, I will refer to them by their Stellaris names while we look through this table. So, at rank 1, when you first let the Dark Gods into your head, the Composer of Strands will give you plus 10% pop growth speed, plus 10 years of leader lifespan, but minus 1 trait picks for your Empire. Now, if you are going to be doing any genetic ascending or any genetic things, that's a massive problem. As a psionic empire, you probably haven't researched any gene technology yet, so you can pretty much ignore that negative. The Eater of Worlds will give you plus 25% army damage and plus 7.5% fire rate, but the negative effect here is plus 100% ship and army upkeep when you are at peace. That's very easy to offset, simply be at war forever and always. Don't forget that in the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. So yes, those positives are quite good, but if you are a player that is constantly at peace, you really, really don't want to sign a pact with the Eater of Worlds. The Instrument of Desire will give you plus 5% resources from jobs and plus 12.5% pop upkeep. That upkeep is quite a big addition given that you are only getting plus 5% extra resource output from your jobs. Yes, you'll get that on jobs that require no upkeep, I would assume, so maybe it's, it's alright, but overall I'm not entirely sure it's worth it if you go with the Instrument of Desire. The Whispers of the Void will give you a lovely plus 5% research speed, plus 7.5% monthly influence, and plus 1 code breaking. The downside of this is that you get minus 7 stability. That stability nerf basically means that in all actuality, you're basically getting no bonus here. In fact, you're getting mostly a negative modifier to everything except research, which is about the same, a very, very minor buff. Of course, you can completely throw that out of the window and ignore that if you're already at over 100 stability. In that case, it's simply not an issue. So my read here on this is that the best one is going to be Composer of Strands or possibly the Eater of Worlds if you're full military. And the other two are all right, but I'm not entirely sure they're worth it for the negatives. From what I can tell having a look in the game, these negatives do seem to affect you all the time. So that's not great. However, if they're only a minor price that you pay every now and then, that is actually all right. That's not so much of a problem. The rank zero telepath output for Composer of Strands is a whopping plus 2% pop growth speed, doubling to plus 5% pop growth speed when you get to around year 20. So I assume that's 2.5%. That's really good. That means all of your worlds will get an extra 10% pop growth. And as a psionic empire, pop growth and pop assembly is the main thing you'll be lacking. So Composer of Strands so far looks to be the best I'm seeing here. Next we get to Eater of Worlds, you'll be getting plus 5 naval cap, doubled up to plus 12 naval cap when you get to rank 2 with your telepaths. Instrument of Desire gives you plus 7 amenities or plus 15 amenities at the second rank. And then the telepath output uh, from the Whisperers of the Void is plus 3 research or alternatively plus 6 research. And from looking in the game, that is plus three and plus six research of every category that will also be modified by all of the bonuses you get to research output. So that is a fantastic extra bonus. You're going to be getting lots of unity, but also lots of tech from each of your telepaths across all of your worlds. Then there are the Empire Unique Buildings. The Sanctum of the Composer grants plus three telepath jobs, plus 10% habitability, and plus 5% resources from jobs. I assume those modifiers though are Empire-wide. So that is 5% resources from jobs on every single world. The Composer of Strands, Grandfather Nurgle, has got a lot of love in these bonuses and abilities so far. Sanctum of the Eater we've already seen, that is really good in ship combat and especially for fielding a larger fleet later on in the game. The Instrument of Desire gets the Sanctum of the Instrument, plus 3 telepath jobs as usual, plus 5% empire happiness and plus 10% trade value. If you're going for a trade value build, this is rather useful. The Empire Happiness will translate to about 3% extra stability, so around 2% extra resources from jobs output and 2% more trade value. That's alright, but that is really not as good as the bonuses from a great old Grandfather Nurgle, the Composer of Strands. Yep, I like the extra trade value if you're going trade value build, but otherwise it's not that useful. Sanctum of the Whisperers gives you plus one Envoy and plus 15% infiltration speed. 
I do hope we get some rework to the way that we're going to be doing infiltration, spying, espionage, and all of that at some point in the future. It's not really a fully fleshed out mechanic um, that, that does need a little bit of extra love and attention to be as good as it can be. That being said, I'm looking at Sanctum of the Whisperers and going, so what? One extra envoy is fine, plus 15% infiltration speed though is not that amazing. And then of course, when we get to around 50 years, all of those Empire modifiers do double up, but so do the negatives. We will get onto what the new chosen traits are for each of the leader types in just a moment, but first I'd like to look back at this overall table because looking at it, it does seem, or at least from my perspective here, to be heavily weighted to Nurgle being somewhat the best, followed by Corn if you want to go for combat. There are some issues with Zeech, but some very good bonuses for the different psionic workers you'll have. And Slanesh just generally doesn't seem that worth it. Do bear in mind though that all of this is in the open beta, so the final numbers we get when patch 3.6 actually releases could be quite a bit different to what we're seeing here. I would predict a bit of a nerf to the composer of strands and some upgrades to the instrument of desires, whilst possibly the whisperers and the eater of worlds stay roughly the same. If you're enjoying this video and you'd like to support this channel, you can do so by going to Humble Bundle and purchasing something from the Humble Bundle store using the link down in the description. Until the 21st of October, there is a massive sale on Paradox Games and Paradox DLC right now. You can save 75% on the base game and up to 65% on Paradox DLC by creating your own Paradox DLC bundle. The link to build your own bundle is down in the description below. So let's look at all of the chosen traits. Now, interestingly, there is one type of leader that does not get a trait with specific entities. The Whisper of the Void cannot affect a governor. The Eater of Worlds cannot affect a scientist. The Composer of Strands cannot affect an admiral. And the Instrument of Desire cannot affect a general. Now, corn hating scientists does make sense to me, but the other three I'm a little unsure on, though I suppose fulfilling the mechanic for all of them makes more sense than just not allowing corn to affect scientists. So, what do all of these do? Right, at the very top level, if your chosen becomes the ruler, the instrument of desire will grant plus 10% happiness and 15% trade value. That is all right. It's not brilliant if you're not a trade focused empire. That extra 10% happiness translates to about 5% extra resource output and 5% extra trade value per planet, but it's not terrible. The composer of strands gets plus one leader skill level, a whopping plus 50 years leader lifespan, and plus 30% leader experience gain. Those bonuses are good considering the fact that with Psionic you get very few ways of increasing the leader lifespan of your pops and this should actually keep them around for quite a bit longer. The Eater of Worlds gets a whopping 15% ship build speed and a massive minus 10% ship upkeep. When we combine that with some of the other bonuses we've seen that is really very juicy. Whisperers of the Void gets plus one monthly influence, plus one encryption, and minus 15% operation cost. They've really doubled down on Zeech being all about spycraft, but given that that mechanic is currently quite underpowered, it's not so brilliant. Let's look down at Governors. So the instrument of desire, that is Slanesh, you're going to get plus 30% slave pop resource output. I'll say that again because it is staggeringly good. Plus 30% slave pop resource output and an additional plus five stability. I assume these traits would stack with other traits, so if you had an Iron Fisted Governor, you could be getting plus 40% Slave Pop resource output across an entire sector, which is mind-bogglingly efficient. If you are Nurgle aligned, that is Composer of Strands, you're looking at 5% resources from jobs and plus 5% pop growth speed. That is really good when we look at the other pop growth speed bonuses we'll be getting with Nurgle so far. Eater of Worlds gets plus 25% shipyard build speed and minus 15% shipyard build cost. If we can combine that, hopefully with the retired Admiral trait that's going to stack on top of that, that would be really good. When we look at scientists, the instrument of desire gets plus 15% research speed. That's pretty much the same for composer of strands. However, the instrument of desire gets you an additional plus two zero per month, which is interesting. Whereas composer of strands gets you plus two moats, gas, and crystals, which is possibly worse, possibly better, depending on your empire's economy. It also gives you plus 25% survey speed, which is generally nice. 
Whispers in the Void gives you a whopping plus 50% anomaly discovery chance and plus three archaeology skill. Now, whilst that would be amazing, I think it might come too late in the game to be really worthwhile. It also gives you though plus 25% research speed, which if we stack that with genius, means you'll be getting plus 35% research speed on a specific category, which is really, really good. Looking at the Admiral's Instrument of Desire will grant plus 40% speed, minus 15% FTL charge time, minus 25% emergency FTL damage risk, and plus 33% combat disengagement chance. Now, looking at the way they've changed things by changing it around with the number of chances you actually get to roll combat disengagement, combat disengagement chance increasing isn't as good as it used to be. This is still good, it's just not amazing. The extra speed is nice from a tactical and strategic perspective, but not amazing in a ship-to-ship -ship combat sense. When we look at the Eater of Worlds, on the other hand, you get a whopping plus 40% damage and plus 10 chance to hit. Put one of these admirals onto the GDF or Federation fleets and simply laugh with glee as you kill everything in sight. Whisperers of the Void is pretty similar here in that you get a whopping plus 40% evasion chance, which is amazing. That should mean that if you stack it with the other Whisperers of the Void component, which grants additional 15% evasion chance, maybe even the cruisers could get decent evasion. This of course works much better the larger the fleet is, and therefore you'll probably want this on a big fleet like the GDF if anyone would let you into the government, that's amazing and uh, good job and yes, let chaos seep in, otherwise uh, it'll be good in a federation fleet too. Finally, generals are generally, no pun intended, rather underutilized. You'll get some good bonuses here for armies, but overall armies aren't that amazing so you probably don't even need them. The Composer of Strands grants plus 50% army health, plus 10% army damage. The Eater of Worlds grants plus 30% army damage, plus 50% army morale, and plus 50% army morale damage. Meanwhile, the Whisperers in the Void grants plus 30% army disengagement chance and plus 20% army damage. These bonuses are overall really good, but you know, given that armies aren't that much of a factor, you can always usually build more of them. I probably don't recommend you blow your only chosen on a chosen general. I do think it's quite important looking at this table that something which is possibly the most important, the combat bonuses here, and Eater of Worlds and Whisperers of the Void definitely get the best combat bonuses, is where Papa Nurgle, where Composer of the Strands, really loses out, given that you don't get an Admiral as your chosen one. That does perhaps go somewhat of the way to offsetting the fact that Composer of Strands has pretty much the best bonuses for empires, buildings, and that sort of thing. I must say, I am absolutely astounded by how much extra here is being added into the Psionic Ascension by way of these new covenants and the way they're going to work. It's lots of extra flavor, it's lots of extra bonuses, it is, yeah, no, it's really lots of extra bonuses. I'm actually quite shocked. You know, you can get Psionic pretty much the fastest of all the Ascension Paths at the moment, especially if you go Teachers of the Shroud. Now, with these extra bonuses, not only is Psionic going to be earlier, it's going to be really, really powerful as well, and that power is going to continue increasing the longer you are psionic, because these covenants get better over time. Speaking of which, basically the speed at which you progress is based on how well your ethics, traditions, civics, ascension perks, and actions match with your patron. On average, it should take you about 50 years to fully attune to your patron and thereby unlock all of the benefits of your covenant. Progress is currently voluntarily, and this is the choice I believe of the devs, hidden from you. You're dealing with eldritch entities after all. There will be of course a price to pay and many of the current events have been changed to provide additional variety and hopefully be more balanced. I assume when they're saying this price to pay they don't just mean those negative modifiers, they mean an overall price. Because looking at some of those negative modifiers, especially for Whisperers in the Void, there's basically no point in taking the, the Empire modifier here. That minus 7 or minus 15 stability will completely wipe out the additional plus 15% research speed you're going to be getting and give you some nasty modifiers overall. I'm, I'm really hoping that specifically gets changed, along with of course the Instrument of Desire's increased pop upkeep at a whopping plus 25%, making it really, really unpleasant.
To make all of this fit together more nicely and kind of make things appear in the right place, the Psionic Ascension tradition has also received a rework and this rework is currently live along with all the other changes I've talked about in the open beta right now. So the starter here is that now you're going to get all pops from your primary species will gain the latent psionic, basically the same as before. The finisher though is that adopting all psionic traditions will grant you minus 10% edict upkeep and a 20% reduction to your shroud delving. You no longer get the covenant unlocked at this point. Psychor is still unlocked on the left hand side and here we have mind readers on the right plus 10 base intel level and you get access to the sight beyond sight edict so far very similar in the middle you'll still have great awakening all latent psionic species will unlock their full potential and you can then allow psionic assimilation of other species to unlock their latent abilities as well whether they want to or not and now we have the difference breaching the shroud unlocks a special project to breach the shroud telepaths then provide an additional five percent resources from psionic pops and shrouded communications, telepathic ciphers, and code breaking techniques are the next step in operational security, plus two encryption and plus two code breaking. Basically, the main change here is that you no longer have to delve and unlock the shroud before you can complete this ascension tree or this tradition tree. You can complete the tradition tree without breaching into the shroud, which is quite a lengthy special project. And as we've talked about, when you first breach the shroud, you will get the access to trying to commune with a specific entity. Select this and then you can complete the commune with the ineffable special project. Do note that commune with the ineffable is more expensive than delving into the shroud in the first place. And I'm still not done telling you about all of this rework to the Covenants, we've got more yet to happen. So lastly, for those among you who wish to pick a specific patron, an option has been added to the Shroud where instead of delving, instead of venturing in, you can pay a hefty amount of Zro to attempt to contact a specific entity. That is 500 Zro and 2000 energy credits. Not that much, especially in the mid to late game, but definitely quite a lot early on. This entity may or may not be happy to see you and willing to make a bargain at this time. But in the case of failure, you can try again and again as many times as you want until you finally get the attention and recognition you deserve from the chaos god of your choice. And as a small side note for those that are wondering, the end of the cycle has not been touched by the rework but still has a chance to show up at any point where you try to contact an entity. So you can still get, if you delve into the shroud correctly, or if you delve in in the right way, I mean, it's just get good, right, people? But if you get in there and you roll the right chance, you can still have end of the cycle as the covenant, but you have to, I assume, not pick an, uh, an immediate covenant, not automatically go with one, but see what the random gods decide to give you. All praise the RNG gods. And ladies and gentlemen, those of you that are still with me, I assume minus your eyeballs, um, we are now uh, at a point where we've covered all of the Covenant related material in today's Dev Diary, but we're still not done. Now we're going to be looking at the new text to speech changes and following that we're going to be looking at the changes to the open beta which have been made thanks to the feedback of all of you lovely people that have gone out there and played the open beta and given feedback to the devs. They have made changes, pushed it and it's now live in game for all of you that want to go and see it. So let's welcome Monzen, one of the programmers on the Custodian team. He is here to tell us all about the extended text-to-speech functionality that is being added in this update. So if you navigate to the Accessibility tab in the Settings menu, you'll now find an option simply titled Text-to-Speech. You can turn that on or off. Enabling this will add a small button to certain interfaces in the game where there is a significant amount of text and if you choose to click it, you will have the text read out loud by your operating system's default TTS voice. The purpose of this feature is to allow players who struggle with reading long text to enjoy the quite sizable amount of written content in Stellaris. What they would like to know is, if you are one of the people who often skip out on reading text content even though you feel that you would be interested in what it says, was this helpful and or convenient for you? Was there a point in the game where you missed having access to the TTS readouts of written text? What do you think about the fact that TTS keeps reading even though you've closed the window that contained the text being read? Was that a bad thing? Did that, you know, pull you out of the game and break some of your immersion? Did TTS actually read the text you expected it to read? And did you notice any TTS related bugs? 
all of that should be left uh, in one of the threads on the Stellaris forum, which I'm sure you'll be able to find on TTS. Maybe I'll even include a link if I can find one. And I just want to say a massive thank you for Monzen to taking on this work and increasing the accessibility of Stellaris. For those of you that don't need a TTS, this feature will be completely irrelevant and you'll probably never even use it. I mean, you might use it if you just can't be bothered reading and you'd like to have it read to you while you continue after the event has been closed. I could see possibly myself doing that in some of my single player offline games. But for those of you that actually need this, this is a massive extra level of accessibility that would otherwise be immersion breaking and, and add difficulty for other players out there. And they wouldn't be able to share in the same experience that we can when we play this game. So yeah, I, I just want to say a big thank you for Monzen for looking out for those people that need additional accessibility in order to enjoy a game like Stellaris. And just a quick point to make before I see a bunch of comments complaining about why would you add text to speech when there's this other thing that needs to be included. Now, basically, if it doesn't affect you, this is just one developer's minor addition that's going to be added to the game that they otherwise would not have added. It might have taken a little bit of time away from doing some other small project, but it may not be helping you and it's going to help someone else out a whole lot please don't write a stupid comment that makes you look like an idiot. I just want to say that straight out of the gate here. And there are some more points by Monzen on this new TTS feature and some of its functionality. So pressing the TTS button again will stop the current reading. You can open the pause menu escape at any point while TTS is reading text in order to make it stop. This is useful if you've already closed the window containing the text and you don't want TTS to continue reading. The voice used is governed by your operating system's default language, so changing the in-game language will not change the TTS voice language. The voice generation itself will then be handled by your operating system, which means there may be cases where things sound suboptimal. But unfortunately, that cannot be addressed by adjusting the system itself, adjusting the Stellaris TTS system. TTS at present will not be available on Linux. And most important of all, great care must be taken to not feed the TTS text pertaining to individual freedoms of synthetic life forms. That is a big no-no. We don't want an AI rebellion on our hands. So basically, if TTS is something that affects you, please go out and try it in the open beta and leave feedback for Monzen. Let him improve the system on your behalf. Now we've got a bunch of patch notes for the new open beta. A massive thank you from the devs to everyone out there who's tried it, who's provided feedback and put that in all of the threads. They've also added a feedback thread for text to speech and have also made a few updates based on the first week. So let's dive into these patch notes. I'm not going to read every single part of these patch notes. I am going to try and focus on what I think are the most important points, starting with the fact that they've adjusted the references to missiles for all modules and sections that now use torpedoes. That was really bugging me. Everything was called missile this and missile that, but you couldn't put missiles on it. You could put torpedoes. Changing that is a nice quality of life change. Combat artillery and carrier combat computers now use the new minimum range combat behavior, which now attempts to back off if at less than roughly half their desired range. That should mean your long range battleships can, if they jump into another system on top of other long range battleships, back off and be able to actually kill the enemy. Definitely a positive. Cordyceptic lithoid empires will no longer start with farmers. They will get food from <clears throat> another source. Cordyceptics can now build their starbase building inside a more Alveo. They'll also now support and oppose conservation acts properly in the galactic community. This is quite interesting because Cordyceptic is the new reanimated trait for hive minds that basically lets you reanimate space fauna that you find. That's amoebas, Tianqi, that sort of thing. The hit and run doctrine now provides plus two disengagement opportunities rather than just plus one. I actually think it should go further than that. I think it should be more like plus five possibly, but you know, this is somewhat a good start in the right direction. Admirals now grant their fleet plus one disengagement opportunity at levels five and levels 10. So if you're at level 10, your Admiral grants plus two disengage opportunities. That is really good. Extra disengage opportunities should keep your fleet alive for longer. Ships 
once again begin to disengage at 50% hull rather than 25%. That was quite a big change putting it down to 25% and meant that any surviving fleet tended to be massively crippled and it required uh, massive repairs before it could go back into combat. They have decreased the base damage of explosive torpedoes in my testing so far and what I've looked at, torpedoes did seem to be a little overpowered. They were quite good at killing the big ships but also relatively good at killing small ships too. They've thrown an additional utility slot into frigates, meaning that frigates should now have two utility slots, which is double the number that your regular corvettes have. Torpedoes will more reliably fire on the initial charge. I hadn't noticed this, but apparently the torpedoes weren't always firing in a big salvo when you charged in. That was a little silly. They've also changed the Ascensionist Civic, which will now also reduce the additional cost of traditions from Empire size by 25%. That is actually a really good change. The Ascensionist was such a niche Civic, to be quite honest. You only really would use it if you're going for that kind of weird, wacky Ascensionist build that I've shown off previously. By adding this change, it makes it more useful. Perhaps not at the start of the game, but definitely in the mid and late game. The budding trait is no longer mutually exclusive with VAT grown. That means you can get budding from pops and then multiply all of that extra pop assembly by a whopping 25% with the VAT grown trait. That is going to be really, really useful, especially for making VAT grown quite good uh, because uh, as far as I could tell so far, I generally wouldn't take VAT grown given that it was mutually exclusive with the budding trait. Polymelic is now also mutually exclusive with all versions of budding, which it should have been in the first place. If for those of you that don't remember, polymelic is basically budding, but on steroids, and in order to get it, you have to kill a leviathan. They've also fixed the AI weight for synthetic ascension. A lot of you have been noticing all of the AI have been constantly synthetic ascending around you in the galaxy. That won't be the case anymore. We should be back to more of the old school version where we've got a general uh, relative normal mix of ascension, traditions ascension, pack, uh, for the different empires in your galaxy based on their ethics and the like. They buffed the roboticist cyborg assembly from 2 to 2.25 per job. That should mean that it is now better able to compete with synthetic pop assembly, which is relatively quite a good thing for cyborg. I was quite worried about its low pop assembly. That was one of the reasons that I put it in the A tier, not the S tier, in my Ascension perk tier list that I did recently. Machine intelligences that have completed these synthetic traditions should now get the synthetic trait on new leaders. I did notice in some of my testing that after I synthetically ascended as a machine, yes, my current leaders got synthetic, but then none of my new ones did. Thankfully, that is fixed. They have reduced the cyborg trait upkeep to 0.3 energy per trait and removed it entirely from basic resource traits. That is really, really good. They have then rebalanced these basic resource traits to give plus 10% rather than plus 15%. But overall, I think that it is much better to get down here to 0.3 energy. 0.5 was simply too much and it made the basic resource traits pretty much pointless to put on a species-wide level. Even on specialized planets, it was a little difficult. They've also made a change to the modular cybernetics tradition, which now lets regular empires use robot modification points for cyborg modification, and driven assimilators can use machine modification points for cyborg modification as well. And for hive minds though, it just gives them plus 10% pop assembly, which is not something that's completely terrible. They've decreased the building and district upkeep penalty from the malfunctioning reactor on colonizable shattered ring segments and made it only target energy. If you don't know, shattered ring has had a massive boost recently as of patch 3.6, or at least in the open beta. You can now, from the start of the game, colonize the other two ring segments right away. There's a bunch of blockers to clear and some extra things, but you now can have three guaranteed habitable worlds right from the start, rather than only having your capital and no other colonies. Colonies. The malfunctioning reactor blocker though would increase your uh, building and district upkeep by 200%, meaning if you built let's say an upgraded uh, alloy forge building, you'd be paying around 7, 8 or 9 depending on your reductions, uh, volatile moats per month just for a single building, which was pretty bonkers. And given the fact it needed the zero point technology to remove, really, really annoying. They've modified cyborg rulers so they now give building and district upkeep and reduce empire size from districts, so that's a change. And the biggest change that I've seen so far in the patch notes here is that they've slightly nerfed efficient cloning to give plus 1.5 assembly instead of plus 3. 
That now puts the bio pop growth assembly stuff more in lines with what you can reasonably get with a synthetically ascended or cybernetically ascended empire. That is quite a nerf though to biological pop assembly overall. That's 25% decrease to the base rate, which you really are going to find hard to get back unless you're going hard into budding on all of your pops. While this video ended up being pretty darn long, we're over 39 minutes in now. And uh, if you're still with me at this point, well done. You've made it to the secret call out. Let me know down in the comments below if you're still with me and or even, I don't know, paying attention. This is a, a monster of a video. But anyway, let's continue with these patch notes. For those of you that were getting upset at Rosgar, if you cybernetically or synthetically ascended, that's now been fixed. He will now befriend you if you finish those ascension traditions, which is rather nice. You can also psionically awaken cyborg pops, but in doing so, it will remove any cybernetic implants they have, and the vice versa is true. You can cybernetically implant things into psionic species, but it will prevent them using their psionic abilities and they'll lose that trait. This is basically a fix for allowing people to upgrade someone else's cyborgs into psionics or vice versa from the assimilation policy. They've also nerfed synthetic back into the ground again. The synthetic ascension path now requires synthetic workers instead of droid workers and in turn it grants synthetic personality matrix as a research option. That does not mean anything good if you liked synthetic ascension. Currently in the 3.6 beta before this, you only needed droids and then that meant you could go down the synthetic ascension path very, very early. Now that you need synthetics, you're pretty much locked out of taking this until later on in the mid game or the early late game. And given that they've nerfed the overall pop assembly you get from synthetically ascending, yeah, things are looking quite rocky for synthetically ascended empires and those people that love going down that path. They've changed the opener for these synthetic traditions. For regular empires, it now grants plus one max leader level and plus 25% leader experience gain. But all of these changes mean that synthetic leaders are no longer locked behind the synthetic ascension path. Synthetic age tradition will now require synthetic personality matrix to be completed, which means machine empires will have to get that technology first before upgrading. Basically, they've kicked the synthetic ascension deep into the long grass in terms of when you can actually take it. The features in this patch notes I've already covered in the first 30 minutes of this video, so I won't go over it again. The improvements part is minimal, and let me tell you about the AI change. Well, AI will now value you offering them fleets. But Balance has had quite a bit of a change. So, they have halved the culture worker modifiers for egalitarians, xenophobes, and xenophiles, whilst they've doubled the culture worker modifier for pacifists. I believe some of this was done because yes, it was a little bit too broken being able to get down to zero housing usage and zero pop upkeep. That was probably something they didn't really like. Doubling the culture worker modifier for pacifists doubles the amount of trade value you generate from living standards, but still it is a minimal amount. I think it would need at least a quadrupling to actually be worthwhile and something you could make a build around. They've made Zro Distillation more likely to appear if you have a Shroud Walker Teacher. That's an interesting change. They've replaced the Bulwark Defense Platform cost and upkeep reductions with Inherent Shield and Armor Hardening as they level up. That is really sad. You can probably no longer get zero cost defense platforms. And I, I really love that ability in the game. Strategic resource planetary automation will no longer fill fortress designation planets with refineries instead of strongholds. Yeah, that was a little bit of an issue. Certain technologies, namely those in the apocalypse tech file, are no longer cheaper than other technologies in the same tier. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't actually noticed that. That's, um, that's a shame. Uh, that would have been a fun little thing to have. They've also decreased missile accuracy from 100% down to 85%. I think that's good. Missiles probably were too accurate so far. That meant that with their relatively reasonable tracking, they were very, very good at killing other Corvettes. And that probably shouldn't be the, the niche for missiles. Something that has not been changed and not been looked at currently though is the massive opportunity you can have by stacking the ascension modifiers and some other things to get zero upkeep on your jobs to produce alloys, research and consumer goods completely for free. If you'd like to know more about how spiritualism is broken in Stellaris patch 3.6, click the video on screen now.